Did you know that you can have faith and unbelief at the same time? Fasting does not build your faith, does not add to your faith. Romans 12 verse 3 says, God has to tell, tell to every man the measure of faith. But the Bible says in John 10, they cannot hear the voice of a stranger. What do you think will happen to the church if every time we send somebody out in ministry, we first fast and pray? We want the miracle power. Are you ready to fast and pray? The world will rejoice, but you will mourn. But your mourning will be turned into joy. Right, Matthew chapter 6. How many believe that we need to pray? How many believe that it's important to pray? How many believe that it's part of your lifestyle, your commitment, your duty to pray? Right? Somebody wrote a book one day and said, prayer is the Christian's vital breath. Somebody once says, sinning people don't pray and praying people don't sin. Somebody once says, it's not enough to have the fire. It must be constantly kindled by prayer. So you can't live without praying. Chapter 6, verse 6. And when you pray, everybody say, it's not if. Okay, so it means you're going to pray. So when you pray, go into your most private room, closing the door. Pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you in the open. If you pray in secret, there's a certain type of prayer that when you pray, not if you prayed, when you pray, you will get a reward. Now listen to this. When you pray, verse 7, do not heap up phrases, multiply words, repeating the same ones over and over as the Gentiles do. For they think they will be heard for their much speaking. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. The implication is that you will ask. Pray therefore like this. Our father who is in heaven. Okay. So the our father prayer is an outline for teaching us how to pray effectively. And if we do pray the our father in secret. Not when we in public. The Bible says you've got to go in secret. And if you pray in this fashion, your father which sees in secret, knowing that you pay attention to the word that you've got to pray this prayer, will reward you in the open. So I pray this prayer. I try to pray it every day of my life. But now listen to verse. Do you believe this? Now in the same teaching, verse 16, first in the King James and then in the Amplified. Moreover, Okay, just look here. How many understand the word moreover? It, so it doesn't matter what you're doing. There's more over than what you've been doing. So if you've been praying, there's more over to do. Okay, let's just try and put it. Moreover, when you fast, not if you, when you. When you fast. Fast means abstinence of food. Webster's Dictionary says, abstinence of food for religious duties. Abstinence of food for religious duties. Now, when you fast, now look at the Amplified. And whenever, when it came to pray, he said, when you fast, or when you pray, when it comes to fast, he said, whenever. So it seems like you've got to put more emphasis on it. Whenever you are fasting, do not look gloomy and sour and dreary. Like the hypocrites, for they put on a dismal countenance that their fasting may be apparent to and seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full already. But when, not if, when you fast, perfume your head. Now the original says anoint your head. And wash your face so that your fasting may not be noticed by men, but by your father who sees in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you in the open. So twice he says, there'll be a reward. If you pray, you'll be rewarded. No, when you will be rewarded. So if I put the two together, imagine the reward. Point number one, 
Fasting and prayer gets rid of devils and unbelief. Did you know that you can have faith and unbelief at the same time? You can have all the faith in the world and still have unbelief at the same time. I mean, Matthew 14, Peter said, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come walk on the water. Jesus said, come, Peter. So Peter got out and walked on the water. Yeah. Halfway through walking to Jesus, he looked at the waves and started sinking. And Jesus said, oh, ye of little faith. Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. Why did you doubt? So the word says, ye who have got a burst of faith. Why did unbelief rise in your heart? Or why did you get a second thought? So unbelief equals doubt, and you can have that the same way you can have faith. And I'll, I don't try and explain it to you. You can see how many times that you really trust God for something. But halfway through your trusting, fear started knocking at your door. So that fear equals unbelief equals doubt. So you can have faith and at the same time have unbelief. So to get rid of the unbelief, you got to fast. Now I want to help you right. Fasting does not build your faith, does not add to your faith. Yeah. Romans 12 verse 3 says, God has to dealt deal to every man the measure of faith. Yeah. But fasting helps you to get rid of your unbelief. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you can have the same. So you can't get more faith by fasting, but you can get less unbelief. Yeah. Let's go to Matthew 17 quickly. Jesus was on the mountain with Peter, James, and John. And he was glorified, and the power and the glory of God was on the mountain. And as they came down the mountain, a man met them who had a little boy who was demon-possessed. And the, the, the disciples could not cast him out, so they brought him to Jesus. Verse 17. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, bring him to me. Amplified. O unbelieving and thoroughly perverse generation. So Jesus says, there's a generation which has got unbelief. It's a faithless, unbelieving generation. Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said, because of the littleness of your faith. King James, because of your unbelief. So Jesus didn't talk about their faith first. He first talked about their unbelief. He said, you know, you could have got rid of the devil if you had less unbelief. Okay. He says, for I say unto you, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, remove, you know, and nothing shall be impossible to you. How about... Explaining the previous verse. This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Now after all these years people say, oh yeah, but fasting was not in the original language. Why would Mark put it in? Why would Luke put it in if it wasn't necessary for Jesus to think you need to fast and pray to get not only devils out but unbelief out? So I want to explain it this way. Fasting and prayer will lessen your unbelief. And in lessening your unbelief, you will automatically have more faith in your faith. Yeah. By using your faith to cast out devils. And devils know if you can fast or not fast. Uh -huh. Jesus said, the generation of unbelief will get out of your life. And then devils will listen to you. Because you don't need much faith, only a little bit of faith. Only small faith, you don't need big faith. Acts chapter 13, point number two. Fasting combined with prayer will definitely help you to hear the voice of the Lord. I mean, the Bible says, my sheep hear my voice. But how is it that we are his sheep and we still struggle to hear his voice? 
It's because there are too many other voices. But the Bible says in John 10, they cannot hear the voice of a stranger. But how is it that most Christians know the voice of the stranger? Oh, the devil made me do. It can't be the devil because the Bible says you can't know the voice of a stranger. So the only voice you know is the voice of your unrenewed mind. Listen to Acts chapter 13. Now in the church assembly at Antioch, there were prophets, inspired interpreters of the will and purposes of God, and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Nigger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a member of of the court of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. Now, people, this is about 60 years after Christ. So if you think fasting is not a New Testament ritual, I'm sorry for you. This is long after the crucifixion. This is long after the salvation of Paul because he was already one of the apostles. He was already named one of the, of the prophets. And the Holy Spirit said, you got to hear this. People struggle to hear the voice. They can hear all different voices. But if the Spirit speaks, there will be results. You can't tell me God says and there's no results. God said, I must do that. Brother, if there's no results, you're lying. You've been deceived. You're in deception. You didn't hear the voice of the Lord. You heard a wrong voice. So to be honest, there's got to be results if you say God said. So he says, the Holy Spirit said, separate now for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and prayer, they put their hands on them and sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit. Those who's making notes just put in Acts 14, 23. Did you know that every time they have selected elders, deacons, bishops, teachers in the church, they didn't say, okay, now you now in the ministry. They first fasted before they laid hands on them. And the Bible says because of that, they were sent forth by the Holy Spirit. What do you think will happen to the church if every time we send somebody out in ministry, we first fast and pray? What do you think will happen if we go out on a mission, but we first say, okay, uh, the youth is going out on a mission. They're going out on an outreach Saturday. So the whole church fast on Friday. So before they go out, let's lay hands on them after we fasted. Don't you think we'll see the results like we saw in the rest of the book of Acts? Remember in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, when the three armies came up, up against Jehoshaphat? He said, and Jehoshaphat feared. And he called a fast over the whole house of Judah. And everybody had to fast. The babies, the dogs, the budgies. If you don't believe it, go read Joel chapter 2. He says even the bride and the bridegroom must come out of the bridegroom chambers and fast. In chapter 3 of 2 Chronicles 20, they set their faces to fast and pray. And verse 13 says, And the Spirit of the Lord came in the midst of the congregation and fell on the prophet. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, you don't have to fight tomorrow. How did the Spirit of the Lord come in? They fasted and prayed. The multiplication of the bread in John chapter 6. I don't know if you've ever read the same story in Matthew chapter 13. No, Matthew 15. Matthew chapter 15. Remember, the crowds were there for three days. And then Jesus said, give them something to eat. What did he do with them on the mountain? He was teaching them the most profound teachings on the mountain. I mean, those three days on the mountain was everything that Jesus needed to teach, he taught on those three days. It's those teachings that he said, if you can do these teachings, you'll be someone that built your house on the rock. Yeah. After those three days, he said, Jesus said, if you can listen to that, you'll be on the rock. Yeah. So those are very profound three days. But did you know what Matthew 15 says about those three days? Around about 30, 31, 32, 33. Jesus said, I can't send them away after three days of fasting. Oh, no. We thought they were just without food. They were just there hungry. Jesus said, we can't send them away after three days of fasting. So let's give them food first before we send them away. Because my heart goes out. They've been fasting for three days trying to hear my voice. Let's go to Acts 10. Now, this story is how Paul was on this ship. Now, how many knows the story of the ship? 
where they were in this, this harbor. I mean, this harbor had a beautiful name. It was called Fair Havens. And everything about this harbor sounded so nice. And the captain of the ship said, let's go. And Paul says, if you go, the ship will be lost. Everything on the ship will be lost. And even our lives will be lost. Everybody on the ship will die if we go. So the word of the Lord is, we're going to die if we go. Okay. Let's read the story. Let's pick it up here and there. Verse 8, hardly pausing it, they came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens. Now we're unto the, the city of Lysaia. Now when much time was spent, and sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed. Paul admonished them and said to them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt, much damage, not only of the lading and the ship, but also of our lives. Now, it's clear that the fast was over. Now, we know that they had specific times when they had to fast. So now this time when they had to fast was now over. So nobody had to fast anymore. So Paul says, if you go, the ship's going to be gone and we're going to be gone. And the fast is already over. So we can't now fast for this because the fast is over. So please just listen. So God must have spoken to Paul during the time of the fast. Nevertheless, verse 11, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. So we know a storm came. Something like the Demoina or the demon. I mean, the, the, some, some cyclone because it was a tough storm. Okay? Now let's pick it up, verse 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened to me and not have loosed from Crete to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by, my, stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. Now we know they were still disobedient. Verse 33. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the 14th day that you have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health, for there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. The fast is over. I heard from the Lord during the time of fasting. This is now my own words. Please, let's not go on now because there's going to be a big storm. So they went and there came the storm. And the Bible says, so Paul, again after a long time of abstinence, he must have inspired a few, maybe a lot, maybe all of the people to start fasting with him. He said, now you didn't listen, now there's a storm, but we can still change it if we fast and pray. Because the Bible says after 14 days of fasting. I mean, that's after the angel already appeared unto Paul after he were in a long time of fasting. So I don't know, maybe he fasted 40 days. Because the Bible doesn't say how long it was before the others were inspired to just fast 14 days. Did you see the time lapses? After Paul was in long abstinence, he said, an angel of the Lord came and said, okay, it's all right. Everything will be lost, but not our lives. And the people said, how do you know? He said, the angel appeared. He said, how did you get the angel? I fasted. So more people started fasting. So after another 14 days, he said, now you can eat because now I've got word from the Lord. Not even a hair will be lost. Amen. 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 So point number three. Fasting will take judgment away. If I can call it that. 
we'll touch on that judgment away. Or let's call it fasting can change any situation. Remember the story of Esther, Mordecai, and Haman? Remember when Haman, who was uh, with King Ahasuerus, decided to kill the Jews? And Mordecai, who was cousin to Esther, started fasting and praying. And then Esther heard about the story, and she called in Esther chapter 4, she called a three-day fast over the Holy of Israel. And they fasted for three days. On the third day, she went into the king's palace, and he gave her favor. And instead, and Haman already put up a gallows to kill Mordecai. And the next day, Haman died on the gallows that he prepared for Mordecai. And the Jews got the whole land. And Mordecai was made prime minister. I mean, fasting and prayer can change any situation. But are we prepared to say, Lord, this situation in my business needs to change? I had everybody to agree. I sprinkled the blood. I've anointed the doorpost. But still, it's the same. Have you tried fasting? Have you tried putting your bread and your butter aside for one day and say, Lord, I need a breakthrough and I'm going to fast and pray? Amen. Have you? For one specific purpose? Yeah. Right, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul says in verse 4, In all things... We are approving ourselves as ministers of God. Oh, he's very arrogant. Look at the Amplified. We commend ourselves in every way as true servants of God. Can you stand up and say, I want to commend myself as a true servant of God. Now Paul says, I was in much patience, afflictions, necessities, distresses. Stripes, imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings and in fastings. Uh -huh. Now jump over verse 5 to the Amplified. It says, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless, watching, and hunger. So if you look at the King James and the Afrikaans Bible, it seems like he says, sometimes I was left hungry. But the King James says, in fastings. So Paul picks up the same story in, in, in verse 12, chapter 12, right? chapter 11, chapter 12, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 27. He says, I was in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often. So, please church, Paul makes a distinction between hunger and fasting. Hunger is, I wasn't given food. Fasting is, I deliberately put my food aside. So Paul says, I was in hungers and I was in fasting. So there was times when I, nobody gave me food, but there was times when I decided I don't want to have food. So there are a lot of these things that can overlap one another. Uh, remember changing this situation, angel appeared unto Saul. Or poor. So I want to say, we can get our prayers answered. Prayers answered. Even to the extent where angels will appear. To make sure that we know our prayers are answered. That's what Paul said. He said an angel of the Lord came and said, don't worry. For I, I, saw, I saw you fasting and praying. If you don't believe that, remember Daniel chapter 9? When Daniel was praying for 21 days, and then the angel came and said, Daniel, servant of the Most High, the first day you set your face to seek the Lord, your prayers were heard. But only after 21 days it was answered. Because Daniel said, I did not put my foot, my mouth, to any nice foods. Fasting. So he prayed. God heard his prayer. The first day. But he didn't answer it before 21 days. So the angel came and said, you know there was a warfare in heaven between the angels of God and the angels of Satan. But Daniel, it's your fastings and prayers 
that got this thing activated and the warfare was won. So here I am to tell you, your prayers have been answered. Go to Acts chapter 10. Chapter 10, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. <laughs> a devout man and one that feared God with all his house which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. So this is what we gather if we just read quickly. He prayed. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Uh -huh. Do we remember how he sent to Peter we was at the house of another P Simon, and Peter came yeah. Yeah. after he saw the vision of the unclean animals, and Peter came to the house of Cornelius. And now Cornelius is trying to explain exactly how did he pray. Verse 30. And Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. Oh, verse 1 and 2 and 3, we read, he was praying. Now Peter is arriving, he said, let me tell you how I prayed. I was actually fasting. I was in a time of fasting and prayer. Cornelius said, four days ago, I was in fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard. Prayers are answered even to the extent where angels will appear to make sure that you get the message that your prayers are answered. Let's go to Matthew chapter 9. So how many saw that fasting is a New Testament principle? Amen. I haven't yet touched on the Old Testament. Amen. And most scriptures I refer to was after Jesus was already resurrected. So it's got nothing to do with religion. It's nothing to do with the law. It's what's Paul's lifestyle. That's why he wrote so much. If you combine your prayer life with fasting, it brings revival. Amen. How many have ever heard of the 1946 revival? The healing revival. A.A. A. Allen, uh, Jack Coe, Oral Roberts, William Branham, William Freeman. You know, you know the names. There were over a thousand evangelists with tents having healing campaigns in America in 1950 to 1952. Yeah. The revival broke out in 1946. And we all hear the stories about it's a 1946 healing revival. But nobody tells us about the man who went from city to city and had fasting campaigns. Mm -hmm. He went from city to city and he had 14 days fasting campaigns. He said, God said, if we fast, there'll be a revival. If we fast, there'll be a revival. If we fast, there'll be a revival. And the two names, that name, that's named in his one book is the names of the first two that jumped out with the miracles, William Branham, and Oral Roberts. But nobody tells us the story that they fasted between 14 and 21 days and God touched them. Howard, we want the miracle power. Are you ready to fast and pray? Matthew chapter 9, verse 14. The disciples of John came to Jesus inquiring, Why is it that we and the Pharisees fast often? We abstain from food and drink as a religious exercise, but your disciples do not fast. Jesus replied to them, can the wedding guests mourn? Now look at the word mourn. While the bridegroom is still with them, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will, will fast. 
Now Jesus explains what will happen if they fast. No one puts a piece of cloth that has not been shrunk on an old garment. For such a patch tears away from the garment and a worse rent is made. Now listen, neither is new wine. We talk about revivals as new wine. Neither is new wine put in old wine skins, talking about denominations and things like that. For if it is, the skins burst and are torn in pieces, and the wine is spilled and the skins are ruined. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins, and so both are preserved. Now I'm going to say it. Jesus uses a few words. He says, you cannot mourn while the bridegroom is there, referring to himself. He says, but when I go away, in those days they will fast. So he says, fasting is like, you know, it's not, it's not too easy. It's like a mourning experience. Now, when Jesus talked about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, John 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, he said something to this effect. The world will rejoice, but you will mourn. But your mourning will be turned into joy. Didn't he say something like that? Did he say something like that? Jesus said something to the effect, when I go away, the world will rejoice. But you will be sad and mourn. Yeah. But don't worry, your mourning will be turned into joy. So I'm going to make a statement now. And then I'll prove it. When the disciples waited for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, from the day Jesus was taken up or taken away in a cloud, according to Luke 24 and Acts chapter 1 and 2, then in a period of time, 10 days passed. And after 10 days, the day of Pentecost arrived. And the Bible says, on, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there was a sound like a mighty wind. Remember? That filled all the house, and they were seen of them, cloven tongues like a fire, that divided themselves and sat upon it. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit came 10 days after Jesus was taken away in a cloud on the day of Pentecost. What did they do in those 10 days? I'll make a statement. They fasted and prayed and worshipped and sought the face of the Lord. Because Jesus said, when I'm taken away, they will fast. And if they fast, they will get new wine. But before they get the new wine, the wineskins will change. Because Jesus said, Peter, when your heart is right, go strengthen your brethren too. I mean... The day when Jesus was crucified, Peter still took out his sword and nearly killed Malchus. <laughs> took his ear off. He didn't, he didn't aim at his ear. He aimed at his head. Yeah. If the guy didn't duck, his head would have been off. So he missed him and got his ear. Yeah. I mean, that same night, Peter said, I don't know him. Yeah. Yeah. So how right was Peter's heart? How right was Thomas's heart? Oh, I will not believe until I put my hand in his side. So the disciples were all mixed up. Mark 16 says, they were all full of unbelief and they all had hardened hearts. That was the day when Jesus was taken away in the cloud after 40 days visiting them. Jesus said, how is it that you're still full of unbelief and doubt? And he rebuked them for their unbelief and he said, now go tarry in Jerusalem. That was his last command. So they were not right. So they had to get the wineskins changed. To receive the new wine. I'm making statements now and then I'll prove it. So for 10 days they were fasting and praying before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Can you prove that? Well, in verse 12 and 13 P Peter said something to this effect. He said, these people are not drunk as you suppose. I mean if I look at them they look a bit weird. But Why did people say, Peter say they are not drunk? Because the people that came to the gathering said, they are full of? No, new wine. Okay, check it up in Acts chapter 2. The people said they are filled of, full of new wine. Peter said, no, they are not drunk. Referring to what's happening 
He said, they are not drunk as you suppose, but this is that spoken by the prophet Joel. So Peter said, this whole thing today, you can pick it up in the book of Joel. He said, if you want to know what's happening, you've got to read Joel. So let's look at Joel. The field is wasted. The land mourns. Okay? Mourns. For the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languishes. Be ashamed, O husbandman. Now that word is also used when Jesus talked about when he's gone, they will fast. Now he says, howl, mourn. Verse 14. Sanctify a fast. And cry unto the Lord. 2 verse 12. Therefore also now say of the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Now Peter said, you got to read Joel if you want to understand how we got this outpouring. So Joel says, the new wine is gone. So you've got to mourn. How are we going to mourn? He said, turn to me with fasting and praying. Okay? Let's just see. Rent your heart, not your garments. So say sorry for the things that are wrong. Turn unto the Lord your God, for He is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, and repenteth Him of evil. Now that scripture, you can pick it up in Exodus 34. That scripture, you can pick it up in Numbers 14. And that scripture, you can pick it up in Jonah chapter 3. Okay. When God appeared unto Moses in all his glory, when he got the tables of the covenant in Exodus 34, God said to Moses, I'm merciful, tender, loving kindness, and quick to forgive. In Numbers 14, when God wanted to get rid of Israel, Moses said, no, God, you are merciful, tender, kind, quick to forgive. God says, Moses, you got me. My glory is going to fill the earth. So if people can get a hold of this, my glory is going to come. Come on, don't miss it. Moses said, let me see your glory. God said, I'm merciful, quick to forgive, tender, kind. When Moses reminded God when he wanted to kill the house of Israel, God said, my glory is going to fill the earth. Amen. Now, the book of Joel says, if we call a fast, uh -huh. who knows if God will not be merciful, kind, quick to forgive. Okay. Now, God said to Jonah, go tell the city of Nineveh, their sins are now too much. I'm going to destroy them within 40 days. Jonah said, no way, and he ducked into the sea. He said, I know God, man, I'm running away from this command. I will not tell none of you this thing. So the fish came and swallowed Jonah. Now Jonah died, and he was dead for three days. Because Jesus said, no sign shall be given the Jews except the sign of Jonah who was three days in the belly of the earth. The belly of the earth is called hell. The book of Jonah said, I called to God out of hell. So he was dead. So Jonah was dead three days. That's why Jesus was dead three days. He said, that's a sign of Jonah. So after three days, here comes the first injection seat. There goes Jonah. <laughs> Fell on the shore. Imagine three days in hell. He must have been burned to a piece of charcoal. But never mind that, his body was in the belly of the fish. So imagine how the Chorakis ate his flesh in three days. I mean, he must have been white because of all the acids and stuff in the stomach. You know, seaweed all around his neck. Here he comes. He must have been looking like something out of the book of Revelation when he jumped on that <laughs> island, you know. Something like the beast or the dragon or, you know. And here he come one, repent. You would have. Okay, so look at chapter 3. <laughs> chapter 3 in Jonah. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach and cry out the preaching that I tell you. So Jonah arose 
He, you would have too. And he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city of three days journey. 60 miles in circumference. Brother, that's a big city. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried. Forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God. Oh my. And what did they do? Come on, those that got the Bible, what did they do? What did they do? They proclaimed a fast. Put on sackcloth from the greatest even to the least. And this is what they said, verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Now keep your hand there and go back to Joel. Verse 14, who knoweth if God will not return and repent? Oh no, yeah, you didn't hear. Yeah, yeah. What did they say? Who knows if God will not turn and repent? What did Joel say? If we fast, who knows if God will not turn and repent? Turn and repent to what? Turn to the fact that he's merciful, gracious, quick to forgive, and ready to bring new wine into new wine skins. Now look at Jonah chapter 3 verse 10. And God saw their works, that they turned from the evil way. But God already said, I'm going to destroy you. Yeah. And God repented of the evil. God repented of the evil that he said he would do unto them. And he did it not. Oh no. Oh no. To think man can change the mind of God. By putting aside his food and fast and pray and say, God, will you not repent? Turn your anger away. God is not out to destroy nations. God is out to save nations. So God is not looking for someone to say how he's going to destroy South Africa. How oh, with our new government, I tell you, we're on the way to destruction. No! You're supposed to fast and pray and say, we're on our way to a mighty Holy Ghost revival. Brother, if 120 could do it, 2,000 years ago. Can't we do it right now? Yeah. Okay, Joel chapter 2. Verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Verse 28. And afterward I will pour out my spirit. And you can go read how he talks about the new wine and the new wine skins in Joel 1 and Joel chapter 2. Can you not fast one day and pray for just one reason? Who knows if God will not repent and turn around and change everything? And what about you watching by television? I mean, I don't know when you're going to hear this message. But what about you putting your food aside and fast one day for your nation, for your problems, for your situation, for your work, for your finances? For your health. Hey guys, please remember to click the subscribe button on your screen so that we can inform you when we're uploading more content and we have a full library of content to be uploaded, so you're going to be blessed by that. Remember to click subscribe. Bless you.